Hi, happy Palm Sunday, if there is such a thing. Today we celebrate the Passion of the Lord, or the entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. There is uh, the blessing of the palms, which you have done, and when you come and want to pick up palms, they are in the foyer of the church, along with a bulletin, and maybe say a little prayer while you're there to the good Lord, that he will have mercy on us and help us in these difficult times. Anyway, here's the Palm Sunday, the Lord's Passion at the beginning, as before we walk in. When Jesus and the disciples drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite of you, and immediately you will find an ass tethered and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them here to me. And if anyone should say anything to you, reply, The master has need of them. Then he will send them at once. This happened so that what had been spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled, Say to daughter Zion, Behold, your king comes to you, meek and riding on an ass, and on a colt, the foal of the beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had ordered them. They brought the ass and the colt and laid their cloaks over them, and he sat upon them. The very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and strewed them on the road. The crowds preceding him and those following, kept crying out and saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was shaken and asked, Who is this? And the crowds replied, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Reading at the Mass A reading from the prophet Isaiah The Lord God has given me a well-trained tongue that I might know how to speak to the weary, a word that will rouse them. Morning after morning he opens my ears that I may hear, and I have not rebelled, have not turned back. I gave my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who plucked my beard. My face I did not shield from buffets and spitting. The Lord God is my help, therefore I am not disgraced. I have set my face like flint, knowing that I shall not be put to shame. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? All who see me scoff at me. They mock me with parted lips. They wag their heads. He relied on the Lord, let him deliver him, let him rescue him, if he loves him. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Indeed, many dogs surround me, a pack of evildoers closes in upon me. They have pierced my hands and my feet, I can count all my bones. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? They divide my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. But you, O Lord, be not far from me. O my help, hasten to aid me. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? I will proclaim your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, give glory to him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped at. Rather, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, coming in human likeness, and found human in appearance. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Because of this, God greatly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, 
and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. A word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now this is a lengthy gospel, but I read it anyway because it is a beautiful gospel and the essence of our Christianity is right in there. A reading from the gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. One of the twelve, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? They paid him thirty pieces of silver, and from that time on he looked for an opportunity to hand him over. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples approached Jesus and said, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says, my appointed time draws near. In your house I shall celebrate the Passover with my disciples. The disciples then did as Jesus had ordered and prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he reclined the table with the twelve, and while they were eating, he said, Amen, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Deeply distressed at this, they began to say to him one after another, Surely it is not I, Lord, he said in reply. He who has dipped his hand into the dish with me is the one who will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes, as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better for that man if he had never been born. Then Judas, his betrayer, said in reply, Surely it is not I, Rabbi. He answered, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and giving it to his disciples, said, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which will be shed on behalf of many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, from now on I shall not drink this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it with you anew in the kingdom of my Father. Then, after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, This night all of you will have your faith in me shaken, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be dispersed. But after I have been raised up, I shall go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him in reply, Though all may have their faith in you shaken, mine will never be. Jesus said to him, Amen, I say to you this very night, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even though I should have to die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples spoke likewise. And Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here. While I go over there and pray. He took along Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to feel sorrow and distress. Then he said to them, My soul is sorrowful even to death. Remain here and keep watch with me. He advanced a little and fell prostrate in prayer, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. When he returned to his disciples, he found them asleep. He said to Peter, So you could not keep watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not undergo the test. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Withdrawing a second time, he prayed again, My father, if it is not possible that this cup pass without my drinking it, your will be done. Then he returned once more and found them asleep, and they could not keep their eyes open. He left them and withdrew again, prayed a third time, saying the same thing again. Then he returned to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Behold, the hour is at hand, when the Son of Man is to be handed over to sinners. Get up, let us go. Look, my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, accompanied by a large crowd with swords and clubs who had come from the chief priests and the elders of the people. His betrayer had arranged a sign with them, saying, The man I shall kiss is the one, arrest him. Immediately he went over to Jesus and said, Hail, Rabbi, and he kissed him. 
Jesus answered him, Friends, do what ye have come for. Then stepping forward, they laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. And behold, one of those who accompanied Jesus put his hand to his sword, drew it, and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its sheath, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot call upon my Father, and he will not provide me at this moment with more than twelve legions of angels? But then how would the scriptures be fulfilled, which say that I must come to pass in this way? At that hour Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to seize me? Day after day I sat teaching in the temple area, yet you did not arrest me. But all this has come to pass that is written of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Those who had arrested Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. Peter was following him at a distance as far as the high priest's courtyard, and going inside he sat down with his servants to see the outcome. The chief priest and the entire Sanhedrin kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus in order to put him to death, but they found none. Though many false witnesses came forward, Finally, two came forward who stated, This man said, I can destroy the temple of God, and within three days rebuild it. The high priest rose and addressed them. Have you no answer? What are these men testifying against you? But Jesus was silent. Then the high priest said to him, I order you to tell us under the oath before the living God whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him in reply, you have said so. But I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has blasphemed. What further need have we of witnesses? You have now heard the blasphemy. What is your opinion? The said in reply, He deserves to die. Then they spat in his face and struck him, while some slapped him, saying, Prophesy for us, Christ, who is that who struck you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. One of the maids came over to him and said, You too were with Jesus the Galilean, but he denied it in front of everyone, saying, I do not know what you're talking about. As he went out to the gate, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This man was with Jesus the Nazarene. Again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. A little later, the bystanders came over and said to Peter, Surely you too are one of them. Even your speech gives you away. At that, he began to curse and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the cock crowed. Then Peter remembered the words that Jesus had spoken. Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. He went out and began to weep bitterly. When it was morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. Then Jesus, then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that Jesus had been condemned, deeply regretted what he had done. He returned the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in betraying innocent blood, they said, What is that to us? Look to it yourself. Filling, flinging the money into the temple, he departed and went off and hanged himself. The chief priest gathered up the money but said, It is not lawful to deposit this in the temple treasury, for it is the price of blood. After consultation, they used it to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why that field even today is called the field of blood. Then was fulfilled what had been said through Jeremiah the prophet. And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the value of a man with a price on his head, a price set by some of the Israelites, and they paid it out for the potter's field, just as the Lord had commanded me. Now Jesus stood before the governor and he questioned him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. 
When he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he made no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear what, how many things they are testifying against you? But he did not answer him one word, so the governor was greatly amazed. Now on the occasion of the feast, the governor was accustomed to release to the crowd one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had assembled, Pilate said to them, Which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had handed him over. While he was still seated on a bench, his wife sent him a message. Have nothing to do with a righteous man. I suffered much in a dream today because of him. The chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas, but to destroy Jesus. The governor said to them in reply, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? They answered, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. But he said, Why? What evil has he done? They only shouted aloud, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he was not succeeding at all, but that a riot was breaking out instead, he took water and washed his hands in the sight of the crowd, saying, I'm innocent of this man's blood. Look to it yourselves. And the whole people said in reply, His blood be upon us and upon our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. But after he had Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. <clears throat> then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus inside the praetorium and gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped off his clothes and threw a scarlet military cloak about him. Weaving a crown of thorns, they placed it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat upon him and took the reed and kept striking him on the head. When they had mocked him, they stripped him of the cloak, dressed him in his own clothes, and led him off to, be, to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a Cyrenian named Simon. This man they pressed into service to carry his cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they gave Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he had tasted it, he refused to drink. After they had crucified him, they divided his garments by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And they placed over his head the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two revolutionaries were crucified with him, one on his right and the other on his left. Those passing by reviled him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself if you are the Son of God and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests with the scribes and the elders mocked him and said, He saved others, he cannot save himself, so he is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now if he wants to. For he said, I am the son of God. The revolutionaries who were crucified with him also kept abusing him in the same way. From noon onward, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders who heard it said, This one is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran to get a sponge. He soaked it in wine and putting it on a reed, gave it to him to drink. But the rest said, Wait, let us see if Elisha come to save him. But Jesus cried out again in a loud voice and gave up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. The earthquake rocks were split, tombs were opened, and the bodies of many saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming forth from their tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. The centurion and the man with him who were keeping watch over Jesus feared greatly when they saw the earthquake and all that was happening, and they said, A truly this was the Son of God. There were many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. 
When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was himself a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be handed over. Taking the body, Joseph wrapped it in a clean linen and laid it in his new tomb that he had hewn in the rock. Then he rolled a huge stone across the entrance of the tomb and departed. But Mary Magdalene and the other Mary remained sitting there facing the tomb. The next day, the one following the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that this imposture, while still alive, said, After three days I will be raised up. Give orders then that the grave be secured until the third day, lest his disciples come and steal him and say to the people, He has been raised from the dead. This last imposture would be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, the guard is yours, go secure it as best as you can. So they went and secured the tomb by fixing a seal on a stone and setting a guard. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Hi. Well, that was a long gospel, wasn't it? Long readings, but they are very, very important for us because we are to imitate Jesus Christ in many ways. When anyway, he talks about his death, dying is not a good thing for anyone. And that's why Jesus Christ came to keep us alive. It was in 1965, there was a fellow by the name of Bob Butler, and he was a Marine, and he was in Vietnam. And while he was there on a special mission, uh, he stepped on a mine and his legs were blown off. And the war went on, and all the other soldiers were engaged in battle, so they couldn't take care of him right then and there. And he reminded, he was just remembered how, he, how it was when he lay there all by himself. It was just abandoned by the world, abandoned, so to speak, by God. Was he going to die and whatnot? But he survived and managed to come back. He was in a wheelchair and lived in a suburbia, like so many other of the soldiers did. And in the wheelchair, he wheeled out almost every day when he could. And one day, as he walked out, he and uh, traveled down the street. He heard the screams and yells, help, help, my baby, my baby. And he was looking a way to get an in, but he couldn't find a way in. But he realized it was not inside the house. It was outside, behind the house, actually. So he threw himself off the wheelchair. And just like back in Nam, he was robbing through the bushes and brushes and the rocks and thistles and whatnot. He went through and he just came closer and closer until he came to the backyard of this building. And there was a lady running next to the pool up and down, my baby, my baby, my baby. And she came close to realize there was a baby, her daughter, on the bottom of the pool. So he dove in there and as he picked her up, he realized this girl didn't have any arms. And this is how she might have drowned. So I brought her back out and started CPA. And he told the lady, go and call 911, get somebody here. And he kept on pumping her heart and giving her uh, breath and pumping and breath breathing. It was heart-wrenching. And the lady came back out and said, my baby, my baby. And he said, it's okay, it's going to be okay. Just calm down, it's going to be fine. And so she didn't know what to say. But as he kept on pumping her heart, all of a sudden, there was this gurgling water spouted out from the, from the girl's mouth, and a scream came out, and she was brought back to life. So, of course, Mom was very happy and thankful. And she said, how did you know it's going to be okay? She says, I didn't know if it was going to be okay, but I know one thing. Everything turns out good. Like back in Nam, when my legs were blown off this, a little girl, a Vietnamese girl, came and saw me where I was all by myself, couldn't do much, and she dragged me, a little girl dragged me into the village. She didn't speak much English, but she only could say, it's okay, it's okay, I am your legs. Together we make, together we make. And so it is with Christ. We are in a battle. We are quite often wounded and severely injured, death, dead for quite some people. Enter into mortal sin and you're dead to the kingdom of God. But yet God comes and he, handicapped as he was, he came not as a powerful God from heaven, but he came down as one like us. 
He came in human nature. Just imagine, losing your legs is nothing compared to what God has done. God left his glory, his divinity, his powers. He left everything behind so that he could be with us, learn to live this life and teach us through it, and then through his passion and death lead us back home. This really is what God uh, does for us. And it is not a small thing. Actually, our whole life depends on Christ. There is no salvation outside the church. There is no salvation outside of Jesus Christ. So we are very fortunate we have been brought into this church by our parents for the most part. So today we have Jesus coming into Jerusalem and they waving branches and saying, uh, Hosanna to the Son of God, because... That fulfills the Old Testament scriptures, as in Psalm 118, which is one of the Hallel songs, uh, and they praise God. And then it says they are coming in, marching and leading the king into the Jerusalem, into the temple. And there the king will go up onto the altar and offer sacrifice. So as they sing Hosanna to Jesus Christ, they actually unknowingly saying that he is the Messiah and he is the high priest who will come to the altar and there offer a sacrifice, namely not sheep or goats, but himself for us. And this is really, Christ fulfills the Old Testament. You can see like in the Old Testament there was Moses and he led the people from Egypt into the promised land. And now comes Jesus and he leads us from the promised land on earth onto the promised land of heaven for those who desire to be one with us. And so it is everything Christ done has been done in the Old Testament, like the tree of life and the oil press. When Christ goes into the garden of Gethsemane and there he sweats bloods and he suffers tremendously. The sins of all humanity, every sin ever committed comes down and presses upon him his heart and mind and it becomes so oppressing that he starts to sweat blood. <sighs> Not a good thing. And he was strengthened by an angel of God. But he said uh, that the Garden of Eden, the Tree of Life, like the Jewish uh, uh, history or Jewish uh, sages kept on saying, the Tree of Life that was left behind was nothing but an, an olive tree. And so the olives are being pressed and that pure olive oil comes out. So when Christ now comes into the garden, he's not pressed and crushed like a grape, but he's being oppressed by the sins of the world, your sins and mine, and they oppress him. He's being pressed and it's agony and agony which he's going through. Anyway, he's also like the suffering servant, like we read in Isaiah. There he stood before his shearers, not opening in his mouth, and we see this in the gospel today, how Christ doesn't open his mouth unless they're being charged, in the name of God, tell us who you are. And he says, I am the Son of God. And then he says, what else do we need? He blasphemed. They couldn't take Christ as the Son of God because they were preoccupied with political and other things, but they couldn't see Christ. They were blind. Christ came to us now to fulfill all these things. Another example would be, for example, Joseph. Joseph was sold by his brothers, thrown into the cistern, and then he was sold and raised up to high standards to be even next to the king, Pharaoh himself. Christ, too, he was sold and was thrown into the pit of death, but yet there he comes to be seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. So all this, this passion which we are preparing for is a real thing. And we must, in this world, learn to enter into the passion of Christ. For there is no other salvation but Christ. And for those who are in Christ are going through the same passion as Christ did. For is that without the death there is no resurrection. So if we are choosing to freely lay down our lives by denying ourselves, by acts of kindness and love and charity, by faith, hope and charity, so we enter into the mode of being other Christs in this world. And as we are dead to self, but the will of God reigns in our lives, all of a sudden we're being raised up 
in the new Jerusalem which Christ has prepared for us. It is a wonderful gift. But this gift, as we hear in the Gospel today, is being questioned sometimes. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And many Christians or some of the Christians believe that Christ despaired. Not really. It might seem like it, but it really doesn't. Because if you understand the way of Jewish thinking, quite often they start saying one, the beginning of a verse of a psalm, and they mean the whole psalm, not just this verse. And this is exactly what Christ has done. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He says, and so we find that he is there in a depth of despair. When you read some of the mystics, the mystics have said Christ went to the depths of despair. Any human suffering and human despair, he surpassed because he wanted to save even the least of the people who are full of despair, that he surpasses their despair so that even he might be able to touch them if only would they would turn to him and see how he would be able to save them. So Christ is the one saving us and leading us home. But now the Psalm 22, which we are reading now, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It starts entering and going into the mode, and now at the very end it says that God will be, that the suffering servant will be raised again, and then the Gentiles will come back to the Lord. The Gentiles will find the Lord. And so as Christ is on the cross, Ila, Ila, Lama Sabachthani, and he gave up his spirit, and there below the cross is a centurion, and he says, Truly, this is the Son of God. The nations, the Goyim, the Gentiles are coming to recognize Christ. And this is what we have today. We are Christians not because we are being raised in that faith and not because we sort of likes, like to go to church or we get this fuzzy feeling. No, we are Christians because Christ has saved us. He came from heaven to let his glory behind and come to us and raise us to a new way of living. But only if we die to self are we able to enter into the glory. So Passion Week or Passion Sunday as we celebrate is just that a reminder that we are called to absolute greatness. Nothing the world can offer compares to the smallest little thing which happens in heaven in the glory of God. So think what you will lose by losing your life. You lose nothing, but you gain everything. You gain heaven and the one who created everything. God is love, and in, in love he came to save us. It's up to us now to experience the love that Christ has for us individually. We have to learn and see it and meditate and think about this love God has for us. And then as we experience the passion and death united with Christ, we go through it every year. We come to experience the agony and pain that he endured. And as we unite our life with the life of Christ, it being raised to the glory of God. Well, I hope that you have a good Passion Sunday. And uh, we also hope that this uh, virus will go away pretty soon and we'll be able to worship together again. I do miss you all and stay in God's grace. God bless you. Bye.